Bless you all, friends. All right, Marsha, you are getting ready for Shabbat and baking for Rosh Hashanah. That tells you when it's close. All right, I can smell the chalot. All sorts of good stuff happening. And Deborah, you are excited to welcome Joshua D. at his bris tomorrow. Mazel tov, mazel tov. So excited to share that with you. Whose birth? Natalie, it's your birthday. Happy birthday. Today's Torah is in honor of you. Um, I wanted to point to something that we've spoken about a few times over the week, but it really is something that um, I think sh should strike us as important and, and useful in this moment in global history and in our own. The beginning of Kitavo is Moshe telling us when you enter into the land. When you enter into the land, you'll offer the first fruits, you'll recite this formula. We keep on talking about it. Arami Oved Avi, and it's a recitation that many of us know from the Pesach Seder. My father was a wandering Aramean, and he descended in few numbers into this land, meaning Egypt. They treated us harshly. We called out to God. God brought us out, brought us to this land of milk and honey. And one of the things that we've pointed out that I've made sure to emphasize in actually many different settings this week is how selective that memory is. The story told is a very interesting fragment of the totality. So for instance, when you look at the story, there's no memory of any of the book of Genesis outside of this one ancestor, be it Abraham or Jacob, depending on your interpretation. And once we get to Egypt, it's all bad forgetting that for a short period of time, not only was it good, we were settled in the most luxurious suburb in Egypt, Goshen. And our leader at the time, Joseph, was second to Pharaoh. That might not have been an eternal honor, but it was an honor for the time, and yet we don't remember that actively when we are finally in the land of promise. So too, we called out to God, and God brought us out and freed us. But that was hundreds of years later, after the enslavement of our people. And then we immediately say, and God brought us to this promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. That skips both the good and the hard parts of a 40-year desert sojourn. It skips the positive changes that the daughters of Tzlovchad imagined. It skips the negative reports by the spy, the hopelessness that pervaded even the second desert generation's conscience. But what's really interesting, too, is that we see this act of selective memory, of active forgetting, not only in the biblical text, but in its application. A teacher of mine, a very special teacher, Rabbi Erwin Kula, has a comment on this week's Parsha where he points out, not only does the biblical recounting leave out quite a lot, the rabbinic recounting of the biblical recounting is also selective. How do we see this? In the Haggadah that we recite at the Pesach Seder, there is the section Arami Oved Avi, as we keep on saying. But what's really interesting is it says, and we called out to God and God saved us with great signs and wonders. And it stops there. The Haggadah does not include the phrase, and God brought us to this land of milk and honey. And you have to ask yourself, as Rabbi Kula does, why? Why doesn't the text that we have for the Seder, include that final verse of the trimmed down version of the biblical history. Perhaps, Rabbi Kula suggests, it's because the rabbis during the time of the Haggadah were living in a time of exile, no longer able to celebrate in that promised land. And so as an act of selective memory, of meaning making given the world that we have, the real world with all of its complexity, the Torah made its choices, the rabbis made their choices, and now, what choices will we make as we tell the story? So I wanted to share something that's a little bit related. It might just be because I really like it that I'm sharing it, but there's a question in a wonderful book that um, some preschool parents gave to me a long time ago in Berkeley, California, when I was a pulpit rabbi there. This is by a, a scholar named Vivian Gussin Paley called The Boy in the Beach, Building Community Through Play. And it, it, it's an exploration of what play is. So there's a beautiful question here, talking about observing young children playing. I'll just read a little bit of it. Really, 
It's enchanting. We watch children come and go, running, crawling, strutting through the classroom, suggesting themes, confirming identities, and making claims until common ground is established. I'm Superman, and you're the lost princess, and I just found you because you're lost. It is play, of course, and like a novel, it is more mystery than science. How we understand these claims, I am Superman, and you are a lost princess. Maybe I'm the lost princess, and you are Superman. So listen to what Vivian Gusson Paley says about play, and think about how it applies to the Israelites, to our storytelling, to the real experience, to what it is to reenact that experience every Pesach, and to read the Torah today, to hear Kitavo about what will happen when we get there. Can we stand outside of an experience and describe it? Or are we actually just lost princesses and supermen and ninja turtles and the daughters of Tzlovchad and Aaron, sometimes even God? From what perspective do we share our story? When you enter this land, Moses is speaking about an experience he won't have to people he cares deeply about, his children in so many ways, trying to channel God's wisdom for their sake, educate them so that they can succeed. This is not so different from what it is to observe young children. We're all those inner children, so listen to how Paley speaks. We can approach the subject of play in more than one way. We can be guided by the aims and structures of play scholarship, dealing with the theoretical, methodological, and ethical issues in rigorous, experimental ways, adding much of value to our knowledge of play. But I search for the meaning of play along more dramatic paths, trying to capture the shape of a scene before its image is blurred. The superheroes and lost princesses who play in the doll, doll corner and block area refuse to be classified, charted, and diagnosed. Let's pretend turns us into storytellers and actors on a stage where disguises are changed without notice to suit every altered condition and impulse. Do children make up their stories in order to play? Or do they play in order to put themselves into a story? Perhaps the secret lies in another direction. What if children play and invent stories? Because it is the way to distinguish themselves from all other individuals, even as they reach for common ground and community. The boy on the beach seems to make up stories in order to both play and watch himself and others play. No matter how I time these broadcasts, the garbage truck always passes by. <laughs> I'm going to reread those last two sentences so we don't miss them. The boy on the beach seems to make up stories in order to both play and watch himself and others play. We, the observers, have a front row seat at the moment of creation. Friends, that's, that's a blessing. Every year we return to these stories. Every year we return to the stories that within themselves tell their own story in selective ways and we watch. But the question is, are we watching from outside the story or are we lost princesses and Aaron and Miriam? Are we the worried Israelites? Are we the loving God? Are we the land? Are we the readers? Are we Moses? Are we Moses' tears? This text, this holy, complicated, gorgeous, sacred center of the Jewish consciousness that we call Torah, it's an invitation to play, friends, but not to play and think about playing. Just play. Hold the stories. Be in the stories. Tell the stories. Someone else will examine what we remember to say or not. Just as we look at the Torah, just as we look at the rabbis looking at the Torah, let's be in the story, friends. Let's feel free to learn as we play, taking on new disguises, discovering new things about ourselves, building blocks and knocking them down and getting dressed up and just feeling a little bit of abandon. Let's play with these stories. Let's enjoy each other's company. Let's brush shoulders, play on the beach, and grow. Friends, 
Let's have a beautiful Shabbos. Let's daven for each other. Let's daven for the people who take care of our world because they make noises, they pass by, because that's the way it goes. They're working. And I'm grateful for them, even if I'm playing and trying not to be disturbed. We're all in the sandbox together. All right, speaking of sandboxes, haven't done this in a while. Here's a song I wrote a long time ago, sitting under a tree in Swampscott, Massachusetts. And it's a gift for Shabbat. I woke up this morning, a smile on my face Said, hey, this world just a wonderful place Sunsets and sunrise, mountains and sweet shiny sea I said, moderni Well, I looked all around and some people were sad Said, hey, don't you know that things are so bad If you just take a step back See things a bit differently. You say Modani, Modani, Modani. I said Modani. Some people just look for the clouds and the rain. And they wonder out loud, will the sun come again? Listen, rain can be lucky, sunshine's just waiting to be. I say, Mo de Ani. I thank God for giving me life every day. Cause this world is a sandbox and I want to play. My soul feels like laughing, my spirit feels high, I feel free. I said, Modani, Modani, Modani. I said, Mo, I said, Mo, I said, Mo. Shabbat Shalom, friends. Can't wait to see you on Monday. Have a beautiful Shabbat.